What is up folks, my name is Stephen, you're watching Move Into Canada and today we are going to be chatting to one of our expert partners to learn how you can immigrate to Canada through Express Entry in 2023. Now, full disclosure, this video will not be a comprehensive look at every single tiny part of Express Entry. How and ever, if you do want to know absolutely everything about the program, then we strongly recommend you click on the link in the description and create a profile on the Move Into Canada website where you can let us know what stage of your immigration journey you're currently in so that we can provide you with personalized videos and articles outlining a step-by-step -step guide to kickstart your Canadian adventure. Now that that's out of the way, we've got some traveling to do. Yes, we are here over 4,000 kilometers away from the safety of my couch with the wonderful Deanne Aker Lanes from Canada Abroad. Deanne, can you tell our viewers where we might be if they haven't guessed already? We are in the wonderful downtown Byward Market of Ottawa. That is absolutely correct. We are in Ottawa, the capital city of this great country of Canada. And our viewers already know today we're going to be discussing everything about express entry in 2023. However, if they don't know what Express Entry is, maybe you could fill us in a little bit about how it all works. Yeah, so Express Entry is for anybody who's you know interested in immigrating to Canada through Federal Skilled Worker, the Canadian Experience class, Federal Skilled Trades, and very certain specific PNP programs. I think now that we have a little bit of a better insight into Express Entry, uh, maybe we go finish this chat somewhere less busy. Beaver Tales? Beaver Tales sounds great, let's Perfect. go. Anyone who watches this channel for any period of time knows that Express Entry is a pretty complicated and ever-changing system. <laughs> so what should people expect or what should they know about Express Entry coming into 2023? So coming into 2023, we know for sure that the number of people that they want to pick through Express Entry is higher than it was for 2022. So the immigration levels for 2022 are a lot lower than normal because of COVID and 2023 and onwards, we're gonna see them go up. So that's a positive. We should see more invitations to apply than we have seen, so always a good thing. Which wouldn't be hard when we start the programs midway through the year either. Exactly, yeah. so that's you know a reason why we saw the level so low. Next thing that is gonna be a lot of fun is these new targeted draws. So what they've teased us with is these targeted draws could be based on your NOC code. It could be based on you already working in Canada. It could be a draw just if you're in Canada on a work permit at the moment. Okay, regardless of occupation, it could just potentially, you're working here. Exactly. Oh, okay. So that could be one of the things they said that they could pick. Um, it could be, they even mentioned education, but we don't know. Does that mean Canadian education? Yeah. Does it mean a master's degree? We, we yeah. don't know. Those are the things that they've teased. And one thing that they've kind of put out there, again, very loose information, is it could be associated with where you want to live in Canada. So we oh. know that people always ask us that question right now, like, when I create my Express Entry profile and I put where I want to live, does this matter? Right now, not really, but maybe in 2023, we're going to see that change. And that's like every time Sean Fraser has a, a talk somewhere, yeah. you're expecting all this extreme detail. And he just comes out and comes out with a very loose statement. And then the media release after is also a very loose statement. <laughs> so. Again, 2023, I think, is going to be a lot of fun. And I think that there is a lot of potential that people who wouldn't normally be chosen, maybe because their score is lower than expected, are actually going to have a real chance in 2023. I know a lot of our viewers are interested in moving to Canada and living and working in Canada through Express Entry, getting their PR through Express Entry. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about what the steps are to come here through Express Entry? and uh, the documentation that might be needed. Yeah, definitely. So what I always tell my clients, the first two things you're always going to need with Express Entry before you even create a profile is you need a language test. So an approved language test. And this is either going to be in English or French. And the other thing, depending on what category you're applying through. So if you're going to be through Federal Skilled Worker, it's essential. The other category is not so much, but an educational credential assessment. So this is to give you points for your hard earned degree yes. or certificate or diploma. And you have to have a valid passport or an ID document. So those three things will come into play just to create your profile. Okay. Now 
when you create the profile, a lot of people believe you have to upload documents. You actually don't have to upload anything to create your Express Entry profile. You're just typing in the information and actually have to have the reports handy. Oh, okay. So they're gonna ask you for your language test results. They will ask you about your education and if you did get it assessed, your report number. And then your work experience, which is obviously essential. And then your passport details. So if you don't have a valid passport, you have to have that or a valid ID document, which no one really harps on. Yeah. So if your passport's expiring, you're gonna wanna renew that because it has to stay valid for your profile to be valid. So those are the main things you need to just even get in place to create your profile. So in summary, people can actually put themselves into the application process without needing all these other things that we hear, like police certs and uh, medical uh, assessments and everything else, they can start that process with kind of the bare minimum. Exactly. Um, it's really sim simple, simple yeah. to create the express entry profile. When we look at things like medicals, police clearances, bank statements, you don't want to get those right now because they actually expire. Yes. Yeah. And you don't want to go and pay a second time to do those things. So it's really just those basic documents to get started. And then everything else is once you get that invitation to apply. Obviously, there will be certain documents you can prep ahead of time that are not time sensitive. Yeah. But to get started, it's really just those things that we discussed. Deanne, for anyone who is about to enter the pool or is currently in the pool, I'm sure one of the biggest things that they're looking for is how do I get pulled from the pool faster? Yes. So what can candidates do? How can they be proactive? How can they expedite maybe their, their application? Some people are going to have a few options here and some people it's going to be quite limited. But probably the number one thing that you can do is make sure that your language test results are as high as possible. And I know I make that sound easy. It's it's. If you're a native English speaker, it's a fairly straightforward test. If it's not your first language, it's complicated. Yeah. But for some people, when I've done calculations, if they can rewrite their test and even increase, like I had someone the other day, it was one section that had to bring up their IELTS by 0 0.5. 0 0.5. And it, 0 0.5 is gonna give them 57 extra points. Wow, okay. So I always start with the language test. That's the first thing in a consult. I always want to see is your language test results if you have it, because I want to see if we can drive your score up there, because yeah. that's, a, that's a huge factor for people. If you are sitting there and you're like, well, I know some French, yes. and maybe I've done my language test for English. Well, if you have any French capabilities and you think it's in listening, reading, writing, and speaking, do the French test. See how you come out, because if you surprise yourself and you're at the intermediate level, that can add over 50 points. Otherwise, you might get four extra points, but as we've seen with Express Entry, that four points could make or break an ITA. A year of Canadian work experience. So if you are lucky enough to be in Canada, you know, on a open work permit, IEC, spousal open work permit, if you can get that year of skilled experience, well, that's gonna drive your score up with the, the points for Canadian work experience. And a lot of clients that I sit with now, maybe none of those were options. You know, they've maxed out their language test. They can't find jobs in Canada and they're not lucky enough to have that open permit. We maybe look at studying in Canada because if you complete a qualification in Canada, you'll get points for the Canadian study. And then once you graduate, if you're eligible to get that postgraduate work permit, and then you get Canadian experience on top of that, well, then you're just really bringing in extra points yeah. with that. All those points are adding up. Next thing you know, you're, you're pulled from the pool the next day. Exactly. So some of those are more longer term, but yeah. the, you know, the quick fixes, so to speak, is usually the language test, if we can. And then also looking at what provincial nominations you might be eligible for, because there's, you know, a, a very limited number of provinces, but they will look at people that don't have job offers and no connections to Canada. And you might be targeted just based on your occupation code. Deanne, let's talk a little bit about PMPs, provincial nominee programs. Yes. How are we expecting them to interact with Express Entry in 2023? And what do people need to know? So the ones that work with Express Entry, what actually happens is you have to create your Express Entry profile first. So Express Entry profile comes first. Right, okay. Then depending on the province that you're with, it might be that you have a job offer or that you don't. Um, you would then go to the province, like British Columbia, I'll throw that out there. Okay. So you create your Express Entry profile, 
Then you go to the British Columbia PNP website and you create your expression of interest for BC. Okay. Then if BC picks you, you submit your documents to BC first. They approve you. They give you your provincial nomination. If it's an express entry linked PNP, they'll log into your express entry profile, load the nomination. Okay. I know, a lot of steps here. Oof. You accept it, and then it adds the 600 points to your score. So it's not just, I want a PNP, I get 600 points. Like there's a lot of little steps that work in there. Okay, interesting. So if we look at a passive PNP, as I like to call it, because you don't have to proactively go do the second step with the, the province's website, you'll create your express entry profile. And one of the questions that they ask you is, which provinces would you be interested in living in? Right. And you can select all. Like it, you can tick off specific provinces or you can select all. So if you're looking for a nomination, tick all, because you, you're, <laughs> you, want, you want to be open to everything. Yeah. And then what some of these provinces can do is when they're picking people, they just say, we want to be shown all the profiles where people have worked in this code. So what you need to make sure is if you're open to all provinces, you're, you're not picky, you just want a nomination from anywhere, pick all provinces. And then there's two sub questions that will show up. It'll ask if you're okay with sharing your profile with specifically BC and Ontario. And it, it just asks that because the legalities yeah. behind the scenes of information sharing what they're allowed to share with the provinces. Um, so you have to tick yes. Is there any benefit to not clicking it other than the fact that you have zero intention of living anywhere else? I always still say pick all. And the reason I say it is we know that they're always first step. They're going to contact you with a notification of interest. And they very clearly say, if you are interested <laughs> yeah. in our province, now you submit the documents to us. So if they approach you and you say, I'm never moving to Alberta, well, then you just ignore it. Yeah. And that's it. No harm done. You can still be eligible to be contacted by another province. Deanne, my last question for you, and it's one that I, I hope a lot of reviewers don't have to go through, but it's, mm. it's an important piece. Yeah. It's an important question to ask. If your express entry profile is rejected. Okay, yeah. Why might that be in a broad sense? What yeah. have you seen in yeah. your experience? And what can people do about that? Okay, so I'm gonna clarify with one question. So do we mean the profile itself or your permanent residence application? Let's go with profile first yeah. and then jump to permanent residency just so we cover yeah. all, all past you. Yeah, so if you're submitting your express entry profile and you get a letter back and it's very instant, uh, it'll say you weren't eligible. And it's, it's a generic letter. So when you get it, don't think that this letter was like directed specifically for you. They just say that it's ineligible and they list a bunch of reasons it could be. And people usually come to me, they're like, I've read the list of reasons, none of these apply to me. So what can happen is, I mean, there's a large variety, but I'm just gonna list what I see most common. Yeah. Um, people didn't know that they needed their education assessed. So if you're under the Canadian experience class, no, it's not necessary, it's not a requirement. But if you're going as a federal skilled worker, you need your education assessment. Uh, so if you put in your education, but you don't have the report, the educational credential assessment report, it's automatic that you're rejected because they gave you zero points for education. Right. And that's more common than you would think. Okay. Uh, so I see that a lot. Number two can be settlement funds. And again, doesn't apply to the Canadian experience class, but your federal skilled trades or your federal skilled workers. A lot of people don't actually know about the settlement funds requirement. So there's a question on your profile that says, how much money will you be bringing with you to Canada? And there's actually a cutoff, like a threshold that you need to meet based on your family size. Mm -hmm. So the amount that you put in there, it actually has to be enough to support your family, or again, it's automatically refused. Okay. So those are two that I see very common. And then the last one that I see a lot can be the NOC code. So there's two parts of the express entry profile where this comes into it. So you have to pick one NOC code that is really your main code to be assessed against. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then all of your work history gets listed and you just, you know, assign codes for each line of your work history. 
Now, if you're going, again, not really for the CEC, but more for federal skilled workers, you have to have, as a requirement of the whole program, at least one year of continuous, so no breaks, mm -hmm. full-time paid work experience in one NOC code. Okay, so all of your other experience, apart from that, can be different codes, but you have to have one year uninterrupted one code. So some people look at their work experience and say, well, this is maybe my most recent code. I'm going to use that as the code to be assessed against. Right. But they didn't, they haven't worked in it for a year. Yeah. So the system picks up that they didn't meet the criteria. And when we say one year under that code, it doesn't, ne or doesn't necessarily mean one year with that specific job and employer or nope. just the code? Just the code. Okay. So if you did six months with one employer, and then six and another, and there was no gap between, but you were in the same code, that's okay. Okay. Yeah, but it just has to be the same code. So when you're picking that main NOC code to be assessed against, make sure that you have the one year. Amazing. And then when we're talking about uh, the refusal or denial of permanent resident applications, mm -hmm. yes. Um, yeah, how does that look? <laughs> Why does it happen? How can people stop it? Yeah, number one for everybody is work experience letters. And it's, I guess it's shocking for me because this is what I do every day, but for people who don't, with your work experience letters, so anything that you're gonna claim CRS points for, yeah. okay? Because you might have some work experience that you don't need to claim points for, maybe it was too long ago or it just wasn't skilled enough. Yeah. So it's just anything you're gonna earn points for, okay? You're gonna have to get a letter from your employer to confirm that work experience. Right. Now, it's, it sounds simple enough. Okay, it needs to be on company letterhead. It needs to confirm the dates that you worked there. It needs to confirm your job title and your salary. Those are quite standard in any kind of an employment letter. Mm -hmm. But the one part that's not standard in a lot of companies or just don't want to do is you have to put your roles and responsibilities on there. So we usually suggest, again, suggestion, at least five bullet points. Okay? Yeah. And this, it's almost like your job description. They want this in the letter because they actually have to confirm that the occupation code that you've chosen is the correct one. And your job title on its own is really not gonna prove that to them. Yeah. So we've seen a lot of people come to us after their application's been refused because their letter was missing the roles and responsibilities. A quick aside with it, if someone had their own business or a sole trader, how would that work for them? Lots of fun on this one too. So if you're Canadian experience class, self-employed work is not allowed. Yeah, okay. So, and I love to throw this out there because a lot of people, you know, come over on IEC and maybe they are self-employed and they bring that business with them to Canada. That's not gonna give you any points. So you, you don't wanna do that. Um, if you're federal skilled work and you've got foreign self-employment, it can be done, okay? But obviously you're not gonna have someone write a letter for you. So what they usually want to see is like articles of incorporation. So proof that you're, you're a registered business. Okay. Okay. Um, they're gonna want bank statements from the business. Right, okay. They usually prefer to have a letter from someone like an accountant that confirm how long your business has actually been operational for and that you earn income from the business. Right. So those are starting documents. I've seen them want, um, depending on what kind of business you run, proof of your business address. Okay. So they actually asked for rental agreements because it was the type of business that was brick and mortar and needed yeah. it. So there are certain documents that you can get. Um, it's a lot more complicated than if you have an employer, but self-employment can be done, but it's not just one letter. You're gonna yeah. put a lot of documents together. Okay. I had somebody, um, their, all of their income was generated online. So what they would do is they would create um, like videos and PDFs of how to create cosplay costumes. Very cool. Yeah, so um, you know, you download patterns that you would pay for, like patterns for wigs and costumes, and it was Patreon payments, it was PayPal payments. Oh. It was like not just very direct payments, but we did it, we made it work, Sweet. and it got approved. So there's some really unique cases out there, um, but that might be, you know, honestly, one of the ones where you might want to speak to someone like me, where we have to see what actually will be accepted by RCC. Which I think kind of rounds out this interview beautifully and also shows the real value of hiring someone 
like yourself and Canada Abroad to help with applications because like IRCC is very confusing. Yeah. There is loads of nuance to these things and every case is individual. That's yes. So, you know, if you're friended it one way, it might not work for you. Yeah. Um, sometimes it does. It's absolutely fine. But yeah, I mean, and this is a case again, we don't have to do someone's application. I have 15 minute consultations with people where they just say, Deanne, I need to know, is this okay? Is this okay? Yeah. You know, and we do that for people. It's just to, to make sure that you don't get stuck because if you get that invitation to apply, if it's refused, there's no guarantee you're gonna get it again. So make the most of it and don't, yeah. don't let it slip through your fingers. Yeah. So Deanne, what can people do? How can they get in touch with you? And, and what's the steps to, to hire your services? Yeah, I mean, well, we offer a ton of services. So um, I think you guys probably have the link. We do a free assessment. So if you're just sitting there and you wanna know, do I qualify for Express Entry? Well, we've got a free, no obligation assessment. You'll get a response if you qualify or not. And then, you know, from there, you can book a consultation with myself or one of my colleagues, and we take you through your options. Or like I said, if you have a set list of questions and you can't find the answers on the website and you just wanna to talk to someone, you can book a consultation with us and we go through those with you. If you want your application fully reviewed before you submit it, you know, you want every document checked, you want every application form checked, we do that. It can be permanent residency or temporary residence applications, we do it all. And then for those who want it, we can do the entire application for them. But I mean, we really offer something for everyone's cost point yeah. and what they need. Deanne, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'm, I know I appreciate it. I'm sure our viewers did too. Links to Deanne, uh, Canada Abroad, and the free assessment will all be down in the description of this video. So please do go check them out. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks Great. so much for, for meeting with me today. Great. Thank you. And there you have it, folks. What we can expect to see for Express Entry in 2023. Before we sign off, though, we do have one last tiny favor to appease our YouTube overlords. Just one little like and sub to the channel goes a long way to making sure we can continue to bring these videos to you. Also, let me know you've made it this far by commenting Vancouver's poutine is better than Quebec. And in the next video, I will let you know the best poutine place in all of Canada, as determined by me, an Irish immigrant to Canada, who knows a thing or two about a French fry. Like, that they're called chips for one. Anywho's, I digress, that's all from me. Until next time.